What's up, gamers? It's 4GO episode 9. We are here on time. Um, oh, that was an unfortunate rhyme there. Dang it, I need to stop. Okay, let's try this again. What's up, gamers? It's 4GO episode 9. <laughs> that was unfortunate. And we are here once again um, for the third episode in a row. Um, with RDGH, we did 40-something episodes in a row. Now we're finding it hard to do, like, four in a row. I don't know what's going on. But we are on track, back to regular production once again. I am Glenn Gordon, and with me I have Ben Shillabier Hall, all the way from the UK. How are you, Ben? I don't know. I'm up good, I guess. You're, what's going on? Well, no, it's just, it's, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning, so... <laughs> what was that thing you said? Um, you said something to me before about uh, British people not being sleepy. Yeah, we don't sleep that much, to be honest. Oh no, you said. Um, you uh, we just charge ourselves up with cables and or drink tea. Yeah, you said you said British <laughs> people don't um, don't sleep. They just stop drinking tea for a while. Is what yeah, you said. that sounds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. There we go. Um, here he is. It's 8.51 p.m. as I speak right now here on the east coast of the United States, which means for Ben, it is 1.51 in the morning. That is dedication. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for being here, sir. Um, no <laughs> also, we have Pedro the Birdman Gonzalez. A and DC I've got my character. side kick. You, Bailey. You, Bailey? Oh, where's Bailey? She's on my back, currently trying to groom my hair. Oh, okay. That sounds painful. Eh, uh, it can be. <laughs> okay, you are a brave soul. Hello to you, Pedro and Bailey. Um, let's launch right into this, guys. Um, we have a few tweets now that we're back from some familiar faces, um, and we're glad to have them. But before we go into that, we have a couple reviews. Um, this is <laughs> These are actually reviews from before we went AWOL, um, but they're here nevertheless, and I did say we would do shout-outs for those people, and they are well-deserved. We appreciate your reviews. Um, this one's on iTunes from our friend Shifty. He says, been listening since day one of RDGH. We'll continue listening now that it's 4GO. Love the news and talk and opinions, even if I don't agree 100% of the time. I find myself responding to y'all's opinions out loud like I'm there recording with y'all. Uh, anyways, keep up the great work and on with the show. I feel like you are from the South, good sir. Um... But thank y'all for your review. Much appreciated. Um, and then we have from Stitcher our friend Shockwave, who I believe is with PSU. So good to hear from you. Um, he says it's an excellent show for fans of video games, informative podcasts, hosts and guests have an excellent knowledge of video games, and can most certainly articulate their views in an entertaining and concise manner. Thoroughly recommended. Thank you, sir. Um, guys, we will read your reviews on the air, whether they're positive or negative. Um, you know, we're not here just to make ourselves look good. They're reviews. So whether they're good or bad, send them up and we will read them out loud. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. I am looking on finding out ways to get us on SoundCloud. Um, so that will be a thing too. So wherever you see us, download us, subscribe, review us, and we will read those on the air and give you a shout out. So thank you guys. Uh, straight to tweets now, guys. Uh, we have... Some from at snover 34 z Actually, it seems like he had a, a small conversation, so I'm just trying to sort out what's going on here. Um, he says, I know Pedro's bird, Bailey, is cool, but she gets to be on the podcast before me? Where's the loyalty? Just kidding. Love you guys. <laughs> um, so, Pedro, uh, this guy is a longtime listener of podcasts from PSU. Um, RDGH was on PSU, and now 4GO is independent of PSU, but with some of the same people. So he, he and us, we all go way back, and he's just commenting on Bailey's appearance. <laughs> well, you know, every group needs a mascot, I guess, and Bailey's sort of become an unofficial one with me. <laughs> I love how she doesn't start making noise until you start talking. Yeah, uh, she, she tends to do that. She hears me talking, and she thinks she wants to be a part of the conversation. Okay, there we go. Um, don't worry, man. I, I've asked, actually, before if he could be on the show, um, S Nova 34Z, but I think he said he might have been busy at the time. I don't know. We'll, we'll talk. Um, he said something else here that's pretty interesting. He said, if you want to update your DualShock 4 touchpad, go to flamingtoast.com. I love how mine came out. I checked out this website. It's actually 
a website that creates decals for a number of different devices, not just video game controllers. Um, he has a picture here. Um, if you don't mind, uh, Fonz, I'm going to go ahead and retweet that just so that people can see what it looks like. He has a decal covering his DualShock 4's touchpad, and it looks like it's got Naruto on it, and it looks really, really cool. Flamingtoast.com, spelled just what it sounds like. There are decals for all sorts of things, and you can make your stuff look pretty boss. So thanks for sharing that, man. I'm going to retweet that as we speak, and done. There it is. I'm going to retweet that from my personal account, too, just because... That's such a cool thing. There we go. Uh, thank you for that. Um, he also asked if we've been playing Broken Age. Uh, Gary said no. He responded on Twitter. He said it's very interesting. It can take a while to finish based on what path you take. Have you guys heard of Broken Age? I have. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, though. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't played it either. To, to be honest, I haven't heard of it. Uh, when he said that, my mind went automatically to Dragon Age. But no, Broken <laughs> Age is different. But I'm going to look that up. If, um, I'm interested in new games, especially since Ori has just failed me. Um, what? Ori and the Blind Forest. I, I got home from work today, and I was right near the last dungeon. I was kind of procrastinating on it because I don't like fire levels in the last dungeons of fire area. Um, so I went around, I collected a whole bunch of stuff, I completed a bunch of maps, I think there was only one that I hadn't completed, and I logged on to play today on my Xbox One, and... I lost, like, 25% of my progress. Um, I was in front of the third dungeon, the last dungeon. Now I'm at the beginning of the second dungeon, and everything I did from that point forward is just gone. Um, uh, I, you, you, didn't, you didn't do a revive point? No, I did. I, I cannot survive more than six minutes in that game without a revive point. So oh. I have done hundreds of revive points. I think my death count set something like 300-something. Um, I have done lots of revive points. It just erased them and I, I actually That's... looked I actually looked online and it's a problem that a lot of people are having so um as wow I was lucky with my first playthrough then yeah i says the guy who died four times throughout the whole game apparently you know I, I'm gonna be honest I think that was a mistake I think that might I think that problem that you mentioned was probably it because I, I easily recall dying hundreds of times so, oh okay yeah well, I, I don't know game, what's game. going on the game is hard, but but never like enough to make you want to quit, and that's what I kind of like about the game. Well, I, right now I honestly don't know if or when I will finish it. Well, it's understandable because given how much progress I, you lost. But. I was I was on my way to completing that thing, and now this happens. I mean, guys, don't be discouraged. It's a fantastic game, and it's also available on Steam. I don't know if this is just unique to the Xbox One version, but it's definitely a downer for, for this. I think, so. I think though, man, uh, if, you, if you persist and you make it to the end, I think you'll find it's worth it, though. Yes, but I'm not going to go through all that again just for the risk to lose it all, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, take, take a break from it for a while and then pick it back up again when you can, you know? I'm going to see if I can wait until there's a fix. If there's a fix sometime soon, I'll pick it up again. Um, but that's, that was very, that was extremely disappointing because I was so close to finishing. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah. Um, anyway, here's something else. One, one last, uh, tweet here on our last episode, episode eight, uh, we were talking about indies and the fact that, well, you know, maybe the, um, idea at Xbox program isn't so bad. Microsoft has been doing better. Our friend Shifty, who le left us that nice review over on iTunes, he said, um, well, you want to hear my conversation with an indie dev back at PAX South about the parody and why their game isn't planned to come to Xbox One? And we, of course, said, do you even have to ask? Like, of course we do. We love that stuff. Um, please be aware, this isn't his words. This is just what he was told. Um, what he wrote was a developer for the Starlight Inception indie game that has released on Steam, PS3, and Vita, and is coming to PS4, said that the reason it's not coming to Xbox is due to Xbox telling them the only way they would approve it is if the developers made a special edition, like exclusive ships or other items, since the game had already released on other platforms. That wasn't something they wanted to do, so they just decided not to release it on the Xbox. Um... He continues that she said PlayStation doesn't have a lot of restrictions. They mainly only care about the game working and being fun. So um, Microsoft wanted 
in order for them to be on the Xbox because it released on other platforms, that parity clause we were discussing, um, the developer would have had to make some sort of special edition just for Xbox, and they weren't willing to do that, so they mixed Xbox all together, uh, which sounds like a raw deal for Xbox. I mean, I, I would rather have had the game after being on a different platform than, you know, having some special fancy thing for it just for my console. Um, but there you go. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for tweets, guys. Oh, one more quick thing. Shifty also commented on the size of the last podcast. Because our audio equipment, or specifically my audio equipment, is not all that great, I've been trying to experiment with our quality, and that made the last episode a good 275 megabytes. Um, we won't do that again, I promise. I'm, I'm going to bump it back down because the size is not what we need it to be. Uh, it needs to be a little smaller, so apologies. And keep listening. Thank you. Um, uh, before we switch over, yes, uh, we got a tweet, didn't we? From well, recently it's from Eternal two thousand nine or Trevor Buckout, saying that he loved the show. So thank you for that, Trevor. Yes, you're right. Sorry, I almost forgot. That's awesome. Thank we you. All, I can't remember. Did you mention that thing about Snova talking about the DualShock controllers? Yes. Okay, thought so. Yes, I did. Uh, we're on it the ball. It looks so silly. It looks so cool. It does look cool. I want to get one now. I tried to get the website. It doesn't work. <laughs> the website doesn't work for you? No. <laughs> what, what? There's a server error when you go there. It worked for me. Really? I got. I'm getting, I know it's working now for me. I've got server errors twice. Oh, maybe that's... No, I'm on it. That's weird. Well... Yeah, I'm on it. There we go. Yeah. It has light bar decals, touchpad decals, all sorts of decals. I'm going to have a look while we're doing this. All right, go for it. Okay, guys. Um, let's talk about some games. Um, the, probably the biggest thing, or is it the biggest thing? I don't know. One of the biggest things going on right now is ukulele. Which is, uh, Pedro, let's have you explain this. Okay, so uh, I guess a little bit backtracking. Earlier this year, a new Twitter handle uh, was created called Platonic Games, and they had hinted at a possible uh, um, spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie, um, which was been something that Grant Kirkhope, the musician of the original series, kind of wanted to do since 2012. Uh, we got teased with an image of two sets of eyes in the bushes, and um, that was pretty much it. The X kind of uh, at EGX, uh, the group uh, Platonic, which is formed mainly of veteran uh, developers from Rareware uh, back in their heyday. They're responsible for Donkey Kong Country, Banjo Kazooie, Perfect Dark, Viva Pinata. Um, some from Conker's Bad Fur Day. I think most of the Conker's Bad Fur Day are actually in uh, gory detail. But y you get the gist. A lot of the like the golden hits from back then, uh, some of the primary people came back together and formed this new uh, indie company called Platonic Games, with their first project being a spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, at the time, the project was simply known as Project Ukulele, and on August 3rd, 30th, I believe, they finally released the title and showed the lead characters Yuka Laylee, and that's also the title. Uh, spelled Y-O-O-K-A, and then Laylee is L-A-Y-L-E-E. -E. And on May 1st, the Kickstarter went live, and within 40 minutes of the Kickstarter going live, it had accomplished its funding goal, and within 24 hours, reached all of these stretch goals and completed them. So they basically had to uh, kind of come up with new stretch goals along the way in order to keep up with the uh, the uh, ever increasing uh, pledge amounts. Oh my goodness! I'm looking at a few articles here that say it is the fastest video game to hit one million dollars uh, U.S. dollars on Kickstarter. Uh, keeping in mind that the game is or, or the developers are working in British pounds. Yeah, it's currently standing at 1,349,139 uh, pounds. Uh, I'm not sure what that is in U.S. dollars. I think it's well over 200... Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 2 million five hundred dollars I think, around I there. I think it says, actually. Where is this Kickstarter? Here it is. For some reason, my phone will show British pounds, 
and my, the web will show dollars. So right now it says two million, uh, over two million eighty-one thousand dollars. Oh wow, States. I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because for every one pound equals one point five one dollars. Mm-hmm. Oh okay, wow. Well, phew, I need to check my math. Uh, <laughs> but still, that's um pretty impressive. It's only been active for uh, I want to say four days now. And still got 42 days to go. Uh, the Kickstarter actually ends on the first day of E3. So uh, that'll be interesting. Um, a lot of people are speculating that maybe they might have a presentation at E3 to cap off the final day of the Kickstarter, but that's just speculation at this point. Um, but yeah, you've got Yuka the Chameleon and uh, his sidekick, Laylee the Bat, and they have a whole variety of different kinds of moves, and it's it very much harkens back to Banjo-Kazooie in many different ways. Grant Kirkhope, uh, who composed the music of Banjo-Kazooie, is back on doing the music with this, along with David Wise, the composer of the Donkey Kong Country series, and most recently Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. If any of you guys played that game, you know how amazing that soundtrack is. So this is quite... This is going to be quite a project, uh, and I am very much looking forward to this game. This is one of my most anticipated games of 2016. It, it has an anticipated release date of October 2016, with no specific day given other than October. Um, also, if you go to that Kickstarter, you're going to see some art there, some animation there. That animation that you're seeing took three months. Um, and yes, it looks like that after just three months, so... Uh, that gives you an idea of what we're looking at. And now with a couple million dollars in funding behind it, I mean, who knows where it could go. This is going to be a pretty big project. Um, I believe also that the game is releasing for PC, Mac, Linux, Xbox One, PS4, and Wii U. Oh, it's coming to Wii U also. I didn't Oh, yeah. That. Yep. Awesome. So, so whatever you play it on, it's going to be there. Yep, and for me, it'll... <laughs> I was one of the first people to back it, so... Uh, but yeah, Wii U is my console of choice. It just wouldn't feel right on any other console for me, personally. I'm probably going to get it on my PS4 or something. Absolutely. Yeah, I, the, might get, the, I might just get like, I might just get one on my Mac and one on my something else. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just one of the things that's that's kind of cool about Platonic in particular is they 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 kind of fancy themselves as what if Rare became independent and and wasn't tied to Nintendo or Microsoft, but can make games for all like consoles. That's what they kind of want to do. And they have this, um, from what I've read, they have this grand plan where, where they want to do like a sort of Marvel Universe kind of thing where Project Yuka, uh, Project I keep saying Project Ukulele, but Ukulele is their first game and it'll star those characters, but they'll make another game that's completely different. It has a different pl different play style and different protagonists, but Yuka and Lele might be in it as in in it as like NPCs and maybe some of the villains in their game might actually be friends to that other protagonist. So it's all tied together in the same universe. They want to do this big, expansive universe with multiple characters that get to meet each other and interact with each other. So uh, very ambitious. Um, and that'll depend entirely on the success of Yuka Lele, which from what we've seen so far seems, seems like it's going to be hugely successful and a return to form with a lot of 3D platformers that we just don't see these days. Goodness. You're, I mean... We are just leaving an era where platformer was a dirty word. Um, and when you say, oh, you're playing a platformer, oh, it, it, it must automatically be a, get, a game for kids because it doesn't have guns in it. Um, and this is really where we're starting to see the effect of indies because now all of a sudden there is a lot more attention on platformers than there was last generation. Uh, we've got Ori and the Blind Forest, we have this coming out, look how excited people are for this. I think this is pro partly just because of Banjo-Kazooie and just because of Rare, that this has so much excitement behind it. But even so, this shows me that there's still, uh, there's still support for platformers out there. Yes, and if Banjo-Kazooie isn't announced at three E3 this year, I can probably guarantee you that after this success story... We'll probably see another one soon. Uh, you know, to tell the truth, I was thinking about that, about whether or not these guys could be at E3. I think PlayStation will get them on their stage at E3. Um, they're not by any means exclusive to PlayStation, but Xbox is talking about how 
well, you know, we want everything to be about, well, not everything, but we want a huge focus on first-party titles, which is good for Xbox. Xbox is not known for first-party titles. It's known for great online. So, I mean, that's good for Xbox, but I think PlayStation's had a really huge focus on indies, and this is a big one. So I, I could imagine them on PlayStation stage coming three. It would be a good move for PlayStation and for you, uh, Playtonic, especially considering that that first day at E3 is their last campaign days, which is usually when Kickstarters also ramp up in the pledges. They they usually have this period where the first two days they get the most amount of pledges, and then somewhere in between it kind of dies off for a little bit, and then the last 48 hours, that's when the pledges spike up again. So if they make a presentation in E3 and, and show all these gamers that, that haven't heard of this yet uh, what the game is like, especially, uh, again, as you brought up, on their on their uh, Kickstarter page, they have some of their alpha footage, and it's only alpha footage, and it looks so polished. It looks like it's ready to ship almost, and that was only three months worth of work. I can't wait to see what this looks like some months down on the road. Yeah, if you take this and compare it to Banjo Kazooie, um, I mean, keeping in mind, of course, that Banjo Kazooie is on much older technology. This alpha footage pretty much kicks Banjo Kazooie's graphics right out of the water. I yeah. mean, this is just three months of work in an alpha state, and they have so much money right now going toward them that they're not sure what they're going to do with it all. <laughs> they're, they're still they're still playing for stretch goals here. Um, yeah, and, they were they, they were developing this game on the Unity engine, so they 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 like usually what they're used to doing is building their own engine and having to work within those limitations. But from what I've seen and read. Uh, Unity has offered them, like, uh, in terms of development, like, just almost endless possibilities to kind of stretch their creative muscle, and it definitely shows. So, do you guys think that with this being, I mean, already successful, I mean, I, I still guess they still have to produce the actual game, but at first glance, after this Kickstarter, it looks like it's going to be a success. Um... Do you believe that we could start seeing many more platformers going on? Because we are a few years into this generation now. And this is the first time we're finally seeing platformers getting a bit of a spotlight once again. Yeah, I, I, I sincerely hope so. I mean, uh, a few years ago we had a hat in time. Um, and that was a largely successful Kickstarter as well. Grant Kirkhope's doing some of the music for that. Um, I haven't really heard too much about it lately. I know they're planning console releases, but I think right now they're only focusing mainly on PC. Um, we also have other projects like Lobo Destroyo, um, which is currently being developed uh, by Left Handed Studios, uh, which looks pretty decent. Um, and that's, I believe, for PS4, Xbox One, and uh, Wii U, and Ouya. Um, so yeah, I mean, we still see some of them, but I think that this kind of brings it forward uh, into the limelight, I think. like Because this is, this is high profile. It's an indie uh, company, but it's filled with such professionals and, and, frankly, legends in the gaming industry that it's a very high profile indie title. I'm sorry, can, can we just take a moment to focus on the fact that you just said the word Oya? <laughs> yeah, it's Oya, isn't it? I haven't Oya, Oya, I don't know. I just haven't heard that word in a while. <laughs> well, the thing with Lobo Destroyo is they were they like many other indies uh, were part of Ouya's Free the Game Foundation. I believe it was like for every ten thousand dollars a Kickstarter a successful Kickstarter made, Ouya would match them an additional ten thousand uh, in exchange for I believe it was four months of exclusivity on the Ouya, uh, and then it could release to the other platforms that they wanted to. Okay. So. Yeah, uh, it was uh, one of those. It was just one of those little projects that Ouya had, uh, you know, to help get those indies out there and to hopefully put it on the Ouya console. Let me ask you another question here because this is something I've actually been wondering about for the past, I don't know, ten minutes. Um, <laughs> there ha is Platonic Games, which is born from all these people that were key parts of what Rare did back in the day. And they come out with this game. There's a lot of excitement for it, uh, a lot of excitement for it right off the bat. They stick it on Kickstarter with a goal of just um, two hundred seventy thousand forty-one dollars, which sounds like a really specific amount in U.S. dollars, but keep in mind it's in British pounds. Um, and 
literally within three days, it bounces up to, it's already over uh, 2,082,000. It went up from the time I first read it. It's gone up about $1,000 already. It's just steadily growing and growing and growing yeah. and growing. Those who, pledges keep rolling in. Exactly. Who knows where this is going to go? Who knows how much funding they're going to get from it? Who knows where they're going to be able to take it? And not only that, but you're discussing the possibility of having a whole universe of similar characters. So this is a independent company. Do you see it eventually... If this kind of excitement for its projects continues, do you see it eventually becoming more of a AAA studio? And keep in mind that AAA and indie can be synonymous. I mean, look at Insomniac. Insomniac is an indie studio, yet it's famous for games like Ratchet & Clank, Sunset Overdrive. These are huge titles. So do you think that this could be in the future for something like Platonic Games? Absolutely. They want to keep their team small because from what they've shared in the past, they said small teams were usually better at bouncing creative ideas. That's kind of one of the reasons why they like their current setup over like what they had at Rare uh, during the Microsoft days. There were so many different voices in the pot that, that individual ideas that could make the better the game better got drowned out. So they, there's currently a team of like six people working on this game right now. Six. They're planning on upping it to 15. But uh, all this, all this that you've seen, seen was really done by six people plus two, uh, two uh, musicians, I believe. In three months. In three months. Dang. Uh, it's it's fantastic, and uh, they can only get bigger and they can only get better. And in fact, some of these funds are going to be used to hiring more personnel and to adding more polish to this game. Uh, a lot of the p people they plan on hiring are other ex rareware people as well. So uh, the more the merrier, I think. Although I have to say I'm a little worried because if you're saying, well, you know, we want to keep things small. Well, that does in one way sort of put a limit on how far they can go in such a quick amount of time. And I say that with a little salt because of just how much they've accomplished in such a short time already. But, I mean... These big studios are known for having pretty large teams. Some of them are. I think Naughty Dog's team is actually pretty small. Um, yeah. But I, it, it depends. I mean, their well, animation is pretty simple, so it's not like, you know, we have to capture every speck of dust, that kind of thing. But yeah. at the same well, time, how far do you think they'll be able to go? Well, the, the thing is, when I, when I say expand, they'll probably expand and, yes, pull all their resources on this one project. In fact, that's what they mentioned, too, when they were working for Microsoft, was like, okay, we got like 120 people, let's pull all 120 of them on this project. What they're planning on doing is when they expand, they're going to run multiple projects, and it's usually small teams of 10 to 15 people doing different games each. So they'll have like small teams working on different things at once. But I believe for this one project, yeah, they're... They're going to pull more people in because this is their first game. But I believe as they grow in size, they'll do multiple projects at once. Mm -hmm. And they'll just uh, compartmentalize it. All, all I know is I really am tired of seeing uh, things like the word rare vival. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. You're from rare. You don't have to be cheesy. Hey, that's a selling point, though, man. People remember that. That that's rare had such an impact in the '90s, man. Such an impact, and this is. It you reminds know, me of this dumb commercial I saw from Kodak for their printers, and you know they they'd come up and they like ambush people, I guess, and say that they needed a printervention. Yeah. Oh, slap people! Like, come on, what I mean, you know. You know, I, I like I like all three consoles. You know, I like Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony. But Rare's talents these past ten years were wasted on Connect only games. Don't get me wrong, Connect Sports the first one was pretty fun and all, but to only put this legendary like developer only on Connect titles, it just felt like such a waste. Personally, for me at least, you know. Man, so. I mean. <laughs> Rare and Microsoft, I've seen comments like, oh, well, Microsoft is killing Rare. Because the only thing that Microsoft's really done with Rare is, I mean, besides those Kinect games, is make those little avatars for um, for Xbox. Yeah. Those little human-looking avatars that kind of remind you of the Wii, except they have arms and stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, that, that was disappointing to a lot of people. I don't know. Rare, Rare has been out of the picture for a while, and I'd, I'd venture to say it's Microsoft's fault. 
but they're coming back. And and I think Phil Spencer, you know, has a huge part to play in that. I have to so. be careful saying that, though, because when we say we have a habit, I mean, just as, as a game is as people, as people, we have a habit of when something new comes out that we that has essences of stuff we're familiar with, we tend to be like, oh, this is the next blank, you know? No, no, I think I, I, I literally, I, I actually literally meant that Rare is kind of coming, the actual Rare under Microsoft is kind of coming back because they're not mm-hmm. doing Connect right now. That's what I actually meant. Mm-hmm. Like, but, like, I mean, like, it's, it's, not, it's not just you, though. You were telling me once about how a lot of people were complaining about, about certain things that Rare might do. Or that Banjo Kazooie might have, except this is a successor. A successor. I think the word that everyone keeps using is spiritual successor, right. meaning it's a game done in the spirit of Banjo Kazooie, and it's after Banjo Kazooie. It does not mean it is Banjo Kazooie. Right. It needs to still carve out its own identity. What but were, they want to kind people, of people. Incorpor- what were people complaining about, for the most part? Well, there were some minor complaints about like maybe uh, the characters look a little too generic. To me personally, I think uh, specifically Yuka, not so much Laylee, because uh, the characters don't really have any clothes like Banjo and Kazooie did. But if you look at Yuka's design, he's got like you know he's he's got various different colors on him. He's got the greens and the oranges, and the tips of his tail has the orange, and his hands and feet almost make it look like he's wearing gloves, even though it's just part of his skin. He's a chameleon, and by the way, for those listening at home. Oh yeah, I thought I, I thought I mentioned that. Sorry, uh, but, uh, but yeah, he's essentially a chameleon, and I believe the fact that he looks the way he does also will probably play into how he plays in the game. Being a chameleon, uh, I believe they stated that he'll probably change colors and and have like invisibility and stuff like that. I don't think that would work quite well if he had articles of clothing on him, you know. And and if you really just look at him. I mean, really, he doesn't really look like he needs that stuff, you know? Another, another aspect was people were, were, were some people, not, not a lot, but I, I remember looking and seeing some people were kind of, the, uh, the newest stretch goal that was added was in a full orchestral score. And uh, some of them were wanting it to sound more like the Nintendo 64 kind of MIDI variants of it. Um, but uh, when, when Grant Kirkhope, the composer, uh, was talking to a lot of people on his Twitter, he, he mentioned, well, you know, a lot of the instrumentals that I use is orchestral. It's not live orchestra, but it's orchestral. And the only reason why the music sounded like it did on the Nintendo 64 was due to hardware limitations at that time. If you look at the if you look at the soundtrack or listen to the soundtrack of Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, I know a lot of people that's the black sheep of the Banjo Kazooie series. But if you listen to the soundtrack of it, it really doesn't take away from that feel. It's still Grant Kirkhope's music, and it's still his style. It just sounds grander because it's a live orchestra so uh there there's some people kind of going on a back and forth about that i personally have no problem with it i have no problem with the way the character looks i i have complete faith in this project so but that's me you know there are some things that i'm noticing and and keeping in mind that this is still their alpha stage the art that we're seeing is just alpha artwork yuka's face is really static um i mean in every um, his, his expression doesn't change very much. I think they, they have a few pictures on the titles, um, on the titles of the different sections of the Kickstarter page where he has kind of a different expression. He'll open his mouth or he'll, he has like a little smirk or something. Oh yeah, but his idle animation, yeah. His face looks pretty much the same in each one. Like, the, there, there aren't really many changes to them. Um... And I'm also concerned about the fact that they have a move in giant involving, quote, additionally, there may or may not be a move involving a giant fart bubble. <laughs> that's just, I think that's just their humor. Mm, see, uh, I, they, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. You know, I'm, well, you got to keep Kickstarter has only been active for like, what, four days now? And there really isn't a whole lot that we really know. I mean, they showed the footage. We, we know. We know some of the details, but they haven't revealed what the story is about. They haven't revealed who the main villain of the ca- of the game is. They're they're kind of keeping their cards close to their chest when it comes to this this stuff. There's still a whole lot that they have left out right now, um, and and that that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of like a rare thing from like when they were back in rare they would always very keep the details of the games they were developing kind of hush hush they would release like every little snippet of information every now and then and i think platonic's taking a page from that book so 
Hey, Ben, are you still here? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. I'm just listening to you guys. <laughs> He's like, you're like an audience member right now. <laughs> uh, I didn't really play the Panjo-Kazooie game, so I can't really comment much. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, our, our temporary live studio audience, Ben Shalibir Hall. <laughs> Should I laugh <laughs> randomly? Just just sad. <laughs> I'd say anyone who... Uh... As an Xbox 360 and you haven't played Banjo-Kazooie, it's on Xbox Live. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. So, yes. yeah, but, uh, I had an N64, but I didn't have many games for it. Uh, I have the Xbox 360, and all I have is... I have Halo 3. That's, that's it. Yeah, man. Xbox Live Arcade, man. <laughs> the, game's, the game's pretty cheap, too, and it's really fun. Uh, I, I highly recommend that. Um, if you want to hear some of the music that Pedro is talking about uh, on Ukulele's Kickstarter page, if you scroll down um, maybe uh, almost half, maybe 40% of the way, uh, you can actually hear early excerpts of the music that might be in the game. Uh, there's one by Grant Kirkhope and one by David Wise. So, and, and keep in mind that it's in progress. It's not finished. Uh, I also see that Chris Sutherland, who voiced Banjo and Kazooie in that game, uh, is also voicing the characters in this game, uh, Yuka and Laylee. So that's pretty interesting. Um, Yuka Laylee is definitely making waves right now. I was going to say, additionally, uh, Chris Sutherland also voiced the announcer in Killer Instinct. So Oh, that, okay. <laughs> that ultra combo, that voice, that was him. Gotcha. Can you do that again? Ultra combo! Yeah. All right, uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I just had to have you do that again. That's it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, let's see. There are all sorts of interesting stretch goals. Um, most of which were crushed. Most of which were crushed. They've oh, he's got... also playing, Mel he's playing Snake in Metal Gear Solid, isn't he, as well? Oh, is he? <laughs> yeah. No. Oh. No, no, that's David Hader. But <laughs> David Hader. That's a that's yeah. a great name. <laughs> David Hader's Hader. gonna hate you. There you go. Um, <laughs> oh, let's see. There's <laughs> there's let's see. All these rewards. There's one where if you pledge five thousand pounds, you get a VIP guest attendance at a live orchestra concert in Germany. Um. I'm guessing you still have to pay to get to Germany if you're not there already, but yeah, probably. <laughs> and if you pay something like, uh, let's see, three three thousand three hundred seventy five pounds, which is five thousand two hundred eight U S dollars, you can be in the game. You'll be coached by Chris Sutherland himself and voice a character in ukulele. Uh, you'll get a voice acting credit in the game and all of the previous, all the uh, lower rewards, and it only costs you five thousand bucks. So there you go. I mean, I would request a goat, and I would be a goat. <laughs> Let's be honest, though. If you have the money and you might be interested in being a voice actor, that is a great thing to have on your resume. That well, even if you're not fantastic. interested in being a voice actor, it's just you have the money and you you like the series. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have the interest, but I lack the funds. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so there you go. Um, there's all sorts of crazy rewards. I think they've had to restock on t-shirts. They have one where you get a t-shirt and they keep adding the same reward over and over because it keeps filling up. So, um, I don't know how many more t-shirts they'll have, but it's $80 or something like that for the package with the digital deluxe and the t-shirt. So, uh, there you go. Ukulele. <laughs> there are these, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading this part where you collect currency called pages yeah that's basically this game's equivalent of jiggies from banjo kazooie uh, what happens is you collect them and apparently they unlock worlds and you can actually what kind of differentiates this from banjo kazooie is that uh even after you've completed the world you can actually expand the world even further with pages that you've acquired so uh, you can actually make the level grow and discover more secrets and acquire more pages and stuff like that. And they say that that is actually completely optional, too. You can, If you want to, you don't have to expand the worlds. You can still go through the entire game without expanding a world once and play it and beat it. 
And then you can go back and expand the worlds later if you so choose. I don't know. I, I kind of like the sound of the word jiggies better than pages. <laughs> yeah, jiggies do roll off the tongue a little bit better. But, hey, I still like it. Jiggies. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I like jiggies better. I'm going to yeah, call them jiggies. jiggies. No one can Jiggies stop. were golden jigsaw pieces from Banjo-Kazooie. That's why they're called jiggies. Oh, so what are pages going to be? Are they going to be like paper? Golden pages. Yeah, they're, they're, I believe they're like golden paper. I do. I, I haven't seen any models yet, but another interesting aspect of the game is if you look at the trailer, there's like these gold coins with like uh, uh, blue triangles on them, uh, and they're called Platonics, and they, they actually made a little quip on this. It's like, was the company named after this, or did we name the, the, the actual coins after the company? But uh, what happens is if you collect um, Platonics, you can actually modify how the characters play in the game. You can make them run faster, jump higher, you can make Laylee fly longer, and you can totally customize your attributes completely using these Platonics. So that's kind of interesting. You can shape and customize your gameplay experience by collecting these. Mm -hmm. Kind of like cheat codes. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Except legal and in the game and... And not DLC. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> so there's... I'm excited for this game. And goodness, I, I don't have that much of a history with Banjo-Kazooie, but I'm interested. I, it's, hard, it's hard not to be interested with just how much excitement is going into this game. Um, the only thing I'll say is, and I think I said this earlier, is that when there is this much excitement for a game, usually that game disappoints. Just because the excitement... <laughs> the excitement outweighs what it's possible for the developer to accomplish. So, um, I mean, I think it's still going to be a fantastic game. I'm just going to say, you know, don't don't be like, oh, this game is going to be like the best game of the whole generation. Because, I mean, let's be honest, it, it's probably not. It's probably not, because we're still in the beginning of the generation. There are going to be a lot more games coming out there, including probably some more from Platonics. Hey, they could outdo themselves. So we'll see. You never know. Never know. Um, so, if you want to support this game, and I know you do, just head to kickstarter.com and search for Y-O-O-K-A-L-A-Y-L-E-E, Yuka Lele. I, I can't, I need to stop looking at the word rare vival, I'm so tired of saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what else have we got? I think we mentioned Oya already, didn't you have something to talk about with Oya, Petra? Yeah, the, uh... <laughs> Gaming company Ouya is reportedly putting itself up for sale. Uh, this is actually, uh, I have an article here from The Verge. Uh, it says, uh, I'll read a little excerpt from it. Embattled gaming company Ouya might be in even more trouble. According to a leaked memo, it's putting itself up for sale in order to cut back on its debt. Fortune reports Ouya CEO Julie... Urman, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, sent a memo to investors and advertisers earlier this month saying that the company has failed to satisfy one of its investors' conditions and that renegotiation over the debt has been unsuccessful. In order to make up for the shortfall, Ouya has, uh, would have to find a buyer quickly. We're looking for expressions of interest by the end of this month, she reportedly wrote. And that was, I believe, that article was written April 28th, so I don't know how that went. But, uh, I, I, you know, it kind of comes into play. This was another Kickstarter, uh, one, of the, one of the most successful ones. But uh, for those who don't know, the Ouya is essentially a micro console. It's supposed to basically play like, it's an Android-based console that can play like Android games and indie games. And they were kind of, one of the interesting selling points was that they deliberately made the console moddable. So that you can make your own modifications and you can even develop a game using the Ouya hardware. Uh, and it caught a lot of interest, and even I kind of, I really thought it had a lot of potential, but apparently it didn't really reach that, and I think it's because they spent a lot of money advertising it, developing it, they had that free, to ga uh, free the games fund that I mentioned earlier, and uh, they just weren't putting enough content on it, um, from, from what I hear, I mean, some people like it, some people didn't, a lot of times it collected dusts on some gamer shelves, I don't own one, so I can't really say from experience uh glenn did you say you owned a ouya no i did not but i want to hear oh. from ben because he's been so quiet <laughs> uh i i'm oh i keep seeing i got there's an ouya at my local game store i keep tempted to buy it actually i, I don't know why i want it but i just want one <laughs> i kind of want to buy it for the sake for like the novelty of having one but that's about yeah it. that's that's why i'd buy it to be honest 
to me, yeah. I, I mean, that's a that would be a waste of ninety dollars to me. Well, I'd I'd wait I mean, for the price to drop. I think. Yeah. I have a I've imported a pocket station, so yeah, <laughs> waste the money on that. So. What is the most obscure console that you've ever had, Ben? Uh, well, it's not the pocket station is not a console, but it's pretty obscure. Pocket station. Yeah, it was Sony's attempt at making a uh, little PlayStation memory card playable thing. What you do is on your PlayStation 1, you put your in the memory card slot, save your game like it worked like a normal memory card, but then you could take it around with you because it had a little screen on it and little buttons. Uh, mm. Certain games would unlock bonus mini games on the VM, on the actual thing itself. So Crash Bandicoot had a little, um, you know, Crash Bandicoot 3. If you saved your Crash Bandicoot 3 data on the uh, Pocket Station, it would then unlock the Crash Bandicoot mini game where you had to run away from the, the boulder. Man, um... Uh, I, I think a lot of people really wanted Ouya to be successful. Because, yeah. Ben, if you remember, there was, I think at PSU we were talking about how there was a lot of, you know, excitement for it. And, and wasn't there something going on at um, E3 that year where Ouya got locked out of the arena? Or, or the, yeah, they got, well, they got into trouble, didn't they? They were doing, so, well, I can't remember what they were doing. Uh, they parked outside the, uh, it's, they parked inside the car park. Yeah, but they did that because they were asked to be removed or something like that, weren't they? No, they were. They didn't have any permission to actually show at E3. Oh, okay, so they just sat outside. So what they, they did was, but that, a lot of people don't understand this, they weren't actually doing anything wrong. Uh, previous years, NVIDIA had done the same thing. Uh, but that year, for some reason, the people at E3 decided they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to allow it. Uh, so what they did was they called the police to stop them. They basically, well, no, they didn't call the police. Sorry, they called for a van to be parked in front of their booth so people couldn't see it. I wonder if um, Microsoft and Sony had anything to do with that, because I mean the Ouya was <laughs> the Ouya was big. The Ouya was big. It was extremely successful on Kickstarter. People were wanting it, and so for it to have that kind of presence at E3, I, I wonder if uh, Sony and Microsoft might have felt it might have taken some of their thunder. Not really, because they weren't actually at the, they weren't in the event. Okay. They were in the car park. Okay. So, it being a micro console too, I don't think it could compete yeah. with what they would have to say. Uh, yeah. to say um, well, I mean, the... I, I don't know about that, because you have, um, yes, it's, it's not going to be able to do those big AAA games, the, the huge projects, but at the same time, I think the current mobile situation proves that a lot of people who play video games don't necessarily need that extreme experience. I mean, look at us, we're excited over ukulele, which is an indie game that's only been um, in progress for three months now. That's three months of work up there right now, and already it looks fantastic. I mean, we've been... We've been excited for things that are less than triple A as of late. A lot of gamers have. And I think that that's something that the Ouya could have been successful at um, focusing on if it didn't drop the ball so freaking hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, indie games is basically the Wild West of gaming, man. You've got a lot of, like, really good and some really mediocre titles, but it kind of... The indies are willing to take the risks that the triple A's don't yes they have that luxury because the triple a's are like uh millions and millions of dollars you know if you yeah. take a risk and it doesn't pan out you've just lost a lot of money yeah um, yeah it's true whereas with the indies you know they're smaller they, they sure they'll lose money if the risk doesn't pan out but they lose significantly less money um so that they can take risks i mean we wouldn't be looking at platformers right now probably if it weren't for indies you know, yeah. Plus, even if they do take risks and they do lose money, that's still something. Oh, uh, by the way, I created that game. Yeah, you know, if they apply for an AA, jo you know, you know, EA or Sony, they can go. Oh, look, I was part of this. Sure. Yeah. It, it didn't sell the best, but we got look at look at look how fast we got for funding. Look at this. Look at how big we were. Right. We might not be. As, we might have lost a bit of money, but you know, look look what I've done. Mm-hmm. It's a it's another note on their resume. Um, but Ouya, there there is something I'd like to talk about for Ouya. I mean, 
Ouya came out, and there was something going on with its backers. Because remember, it was on Kickstarter, and uh, some backers were promised an Ouya console. Is it Ouya or Oya? I believe it's Ouya. Whatever. Ouya. 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 <laughs> I'll say Ouya. Um, Ouya's console. Um, and I think that something was going on. They weren't getting their consoles. Like they, they, The consoles went on sale before the backers actually got theirs, or, or something to that extent. And people were upset about that. Um, so that's one way it dropped the ball. Another one was that the initial experience was so terrible. Um, first impression, let me tell you something. When you're launching a product, especially if it's a new product in a market that already has big players, such as Sony and Microsoft, first impressions are important. Oya, I mean, Ouya, excuse me, was the first of several micro consoles that were announced. And of course, a few other companies tried to follow that example, but the experience was not very good. The controller, uh, the buttons stuck, the buttons got stuck. Um, the O-U-Y-A, which are the same as the, um, goodness, what are they called? The X-A-B. Y. Y on Xbox and square, circle, triangle cross on PlayStation, um, those stuck all the time. Um, after, <laughs> let's see, Polygon says after even minutes of use, it said, uh, Polygon saying, after the first hour they played Towerfall, the right trigger was stuck and had to be pried loose. And not due to like extreme vigorous gameplay, but just regular everyday use. And, I mean, they, I guess they eventually came out with a fix for it, but, I mean, that's not a good first impression. And then you go to the fact that the software was not good at all. Um, it was extremely simple. There wasn't a way to organize uh, your search results. There wasn't really a way to find anything. The thing about indies is there are a lot of great indies, and then there are a lot of crappy indies. And so you really need a way to separate the gems from the, well, for lack of a better term, the gems from the dirt. Okay, um, the OEA just did not provide that. The software was not good. The wireless connectivity was bad. Um, what else did I hear? Um, did, I, I don't even know. It was just not something wrong with the HDMI as well. Some, it was just not a good console. And the, and the, uh, the thing was barren. They couldn't find many games out there yet. And exactly. I guess that's kind of why they started the Free the Games Fund, but... Not enough indies, I guess, were coming into the fold, you know? So they eventually went ahead and um, redesigned the interface. They, I guess, I don't remember for sure. I'm pretty sure they, they, re, they fixed the controller situation. Uh, I don't even know. All I know is that it was too little too late. I mean, between the lack of content and between the terrors that people were experiencing with the, with the, the hardware... Um, I mean, that console has just sunk. Yeah. It's just sunk. So, I'm hoping, um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that if somebody buys up Ouya, maybe they can take the idea, the, the idea behind it and the concept sounds pretty good, but yeah, as you said, the execution was kind of bungled. I'm wondering if maybe somebody who, who buys it will, will think of a creative way to, to kind of reinvigorate it and put it out there in a way that'll make it sell better. Who, On the other hand, they could just buy it and let it die. Who, I, I who do you think could buy it? I have no idea. I have I honestly have no idea. Honestly, but, I think that either Microsoft or Sony could be interested in, in buying something like an Oya because they can I think Oya has a few no, no that's not right. I was about to say Oya has a few ex exclusive titles, but I don't think they do. I think I think everything that they've got right now is also available on PC. A lot of it's temporary. Remember uh, that that was part of that Ouya uh, that that deal. It's exclusive for it's a timed exclusive, a four month timed exclusive. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, if not PlayStation or Xbox, I think Amazon would probably take up on that because Amazon has been notably trying to get into the gaming thing for a while now. There were rumors a couple of years ago about uh, Amazon buying Xbox from Microsoft or something to that effect. I remember that. Um, well, you know, that, that didn't happen. I did not think that was going to happen, but it was an interesting, it was an interesting time anyway. Um, but I could totally see Amazon um, buying Oya, polishing it up a bit and making like a fire gaming system. Yeah. Sometime. What about Google? Wasn't Google also kind of interested in getting in gaming? Google was. I, I heard something about a Google micro console, but I never really heard anything about it even coming close to fruition. Ah. Uh, hmm. That's interesting. That is interesting. It does open up some possibilities. You never know. Um, 
it, I can see somebody with enough ambition and funding to, to kind of reinvigorate it and bring new life to it. You know, it, it, there are enough people who kind of are piqued by the idea. You know, a micro moddable console that can play all sorts of indie games and stuff like that and deliver a, a cheaper yet still fun gaming experience. You know, you never, I just, I don't know. I, I think there's still potential in it, just not in its current form. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this sums it up really well. I'm still on that Polygon article. They have a quote kind of highlighted here, and I just want to read it. It says, the, the Ouya can be confusing or painless, and there's no way to know which it will be at any given moment. That's pretty good, yeah. That is pretty good. Props to you, Polygon. That, that's, that's a pretty good quote. Um, and I'd say pretty accurate as far as Ouya is concerned. Poor Julie Uran, though. Yeah. I mean, to tell I mean, the that truth... that was her dream. To that tell the truth, dream. I think that all of this could have been avoided with a beta console. Hmm. If, yeah. they had, if they had had a beta console out there, because they went directly from Kickstarter to production to market. I, they didn't do a beta console. If they I had, thought the whole point of the founder was to do that originally, though. The funding? Oh no, the founder console. Oh, the founder. Yeah, the console. Yeah, the ones, the people who backed it were supposed to originally get an early version. But right, they that didn't get it. Sense. Yeah, that was yeah. that, that would make sense to give it to the Kickstarter, yeah. the people who backed it on Kickstarter, to test it that and was, give feedback. But they didn't That's get it. That's why there were so many complaints about it because that was part of the Kickstarter program. They didn't, the fact that they, they were supposed to get a special founders edition. They lost their opportunity to beta test yeah. by not giving them their. I mean, yeah. that should have been priority. You know, prior, number one, test the thing before we put it on the market. You know, I, I mean, if we have to delay the console, fine. It needs to be tested before we put it on the market. Because, like I said, first impressions, man. I, I don't think anyone's really going to buy into Ouya again. They'd have to do something pretty drastic in order to do that. And the fact that they're offering themselves up for sale right now doesn't seem like they're on that road. Um, so... Rest in peace, oh yeah. It was. It nice. did come out before. Some backers did get it before release, by the way, though. Some did, but they started most sending did them not. out March twenty eighth. Mm hmm. When uh, was when was then the... it wasn't sold to the general public until June twenty fifth. Okay, so some of them, some people did, yes. Yeah. But a lot of them did not. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's their own fault. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But Ouya could have been. Do you think Ouya could have succeeded? I mean, if they had <laughs> done this, if they had done this right, do you think it could have succeeded? All successful <sighs> things take a lot of time and a lot of planning, and I think they were just so eager to get it into hands of consumers that it it it, it fell short. I think. Um, Ben, I think I heard an emphatic no from you. No, no, it, it, it just leads on to more Android consoles being made by bigger companies. And okay. it's, if it had been successful, we would have just seen Google, Ouya, Amazon, Ouya, and then the market would just get flooded with all the consoles. Okay, um, my I, I hate to veer this far off track, but my cat is sleeping next to me, and he just did that... Um, that thing that cats do like when they stretch and then they put both their paws over their face and <laughs> it was just freaking adorable and I lost my train of thought for just one second <laughs> just, just letting you know um, <laughs> oh yeah that's right yeah. Um, goodness so Amazon, Google I would have just seen all of the other major Android companies except for of course Sony jumping in to making cheap Android boxes I don't know about Android, but I could see someone like Sony making, uh, like they already made like the PlayStation Vita TV, you know, um, yeah. which is almost similar in that, you know, Vita's games, um, I want to yes, say they one. tend to be smaller, but I mean, who knows what Vita's games tend to be? I mean, that, that console was kind of a mess in its own special way. I just downloaded Kills Our Mercenaries, it's 4 gig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so some games are small and some games are not, but yeah. well, I guess what I was trying to... got also your PS1 and PSP titles as well. Yeah, I, I could see someone like Sony making a smaller console for smaller games, like indies, 
like like mm-hmm. Sony's indies. They could put they could put the PS One classics, the uh, and the indies on like a, a smaller a micro console, a Sony micro console. Hey, they could call it PlayStation Mini. <laughs> no, I thought no, I didn't have anything. No, yeah. <laughs> I'm here. I was just thinking of the Pokemon Mini for a second there, thinking I thought that was no, wait, no, Pokemon Mini it was. Pokemon Mini? <laughs> yeah. Don't you remember Pokemon Mini? No, I don't. Uh, I was a little handheld device by Nintendo. I've got it somewhere. Where you had they only played little special miniature Pokemon games. They weren't full games, they're like just little mini games. Hmm. It's called the Pokemon Mini. It was amazing. I don't know why, but that reminds me of Pokemon Snap. When I had well, my I N64. think it did have Snap. Originally. Oh, okay. When I had my N64, I had Snap. I, and I missed that game. That was yeah, a good listen, one. I'll, I know the viewers can't hear it, see this, but I'll send it for you here, Glenn. For some reason, I was thinking something like the Pokemon Pikachu thing. Yeah. Remember that? You had to shake it. I, oh, I remember no. these things. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That was, that was what I was going to say. The, 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 basically, Pokemon Pikachu was like a pedometer. The more you walk, the more Pikachu yeah. liked you. I re- I'm sorry. I'm, you're you're sitting here talking. And all of a sudden, I'm like, ah, stuff. I remember. So, um, I don't know what that voice just was. So, um, I'm trying to. Um, Pedro does some light voice acting, I believe. Right? Yeah, I'm just starting out on it. You know, just just. Uh, I've only been at it for uh, a couple months. Like, I I took some classes, but I like to do character voices. Let's so. just say that I have been. I am and have been interested in voice acting. And I have a friend, a good friend of mine, who is just passionate about voice acting. She wants to go to Texas and um, work for Funimation. So we'll see how that goes. I would love that opportunity myself, so I hope she gets it. Well, what, I just want to visit Texas again. <laughs> what was that? I just want to visit Texas again. It's been too long. I it's been can't, 10 years. I can't live in Texas. I'm vegetarian. <laughs> They 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 love their meat over in Texas. <laughs> oh, hey, steak man. there. It's amazing. Mm. Uh, did I cut you off again, Pedro? No, no, no. You're fine. Are you sure? Yeah. No hurt feelings? No. Oh. All of the feelings. <laughs> okay. Well, it's okay. You can go on and do your thing. I'm just going to stand here. What else? Oh, well, here. Uh, pick something <laughs> else to talk about. <laughs> this is sad. What the crap? I can't understand the thing you guys are saying anymore. You, you've, you've broken the pitch barrier. Um, what was another? What was another big story that was going on? Well, it seems like today is just the day of Kickstarters because another another Kickstarter project. We're 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 about to bring up another one, uh, Mighty Number no. Nine. Uh, yeah, I am a huge Mega Man fan. I so when this kind of hit my radar, I backed it immediately. Uh, what's basically new in the news here is that uh, Mighty Number no. Nine has found a publisher. Uh, I believe it was Deep Silver. Yes. Uh, basically, uh, for those who are kind of worried about that, uh, Comcept still owns all the rights to Mighty Number no. Nine and all the characters. What Deep Silver simply wanted to do was give them additional funding and es- essentially have their name on the uh, cover. That means essentially that Mighty Number no. Nine is no longer a download-only title. You will see a full retail release. Uh, I will here. I'll, I'll read um, an, absur- an excerpt from the Mighty Number no. Nine uh, website. Um, so. Uh, Okay, backers, we've been working on something big for a while now, and finally today we can finally let the cat out of the bag. Mighty Number no. 9 is teaming up with publisher Deep Silver to release Mighty Number no. 9 this September. So it's been pushed back to September 15th, and uh, basically I'll, I'll read some bullet points. Um, we're not only just getting physical releases of the game, but you are also going to see additional languages, subtitles for Spanish, French, Italian, German, Russian, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Polish. And uh, you can actually also toggle for Japanese voiceovers. Uh, the community was kind of divided because we had a voice, uh, we had a vote essentially between Japanese and English, and English won out. So those of you who actually enjoy Japanese voiceovers, you can actually enjoy them now. Uh, the additional funding is going to Japanese voice actors. And on top of that, the Ray DLC that they announced a few months back is also going to be included uh, in the physical release and for backers for free. Um, if you download the title uh, for, I believe, like 
what was it? I believe it was nineteen ninety nine for download, twenty nine uh, ninety nine retail. So if you per if you download it, uh, you actually do have to purchase the DLC. Um, it has some of the backers a little worried. Uh, uh, like okay, for example, I pledged uh, sixty dollars for the retro box art and to have all the other additional stuff. Actually, I increased my pledge quite a bit, but I wanted to keep my yeah, I actually increased it to $120, actually. But uh, my initial one was with the, the retro game case, you know, and all the backers are essentially getting the digital copy. And now that we are seeing a physical release of the game, some of the backers are like, well, why can't we just have a physical game? You know, the, the retro game case doesn't have a game in it. You know, it's just a box to put on your shelf. Um, and I can see where the concerns are. I think enough backers are raising enough concerns that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Comcept is going to give people the option. In fact, I would love what I would love for Comcept to do is give backers who pledge 60 and up the retro game case with the CD in it because the retro game case has art that is going to be different from the main publishing release. So it's going to be a unique variant. So I think it'd be kind of cool if Comcept did something along those lines. This looks a lot like Mega Man. It's it's the spiritual successor to Mega Man, just yeah. like Ukulele is the spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie. You're gonna find though, I think with with this Kickstarter craze and a lot of like people who used to work in 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 these big companies breaking away, forming their companies. Again, like like we discussed earlier, the AAA industry is scared to look outside the box. They're scared to to revisit old ideas because why fix what isn't broken? You know, the modern what we see in the mainstream sells really well. And that leaves a lot of old school developers embittered. So they leave, they form their own companies, and they try to recreate what made them what they loved to make in the past and what other gamers, retro gamers, loved as well. So you're going to find a lot of that. You know, you got Platinum Studios, which used to be completely Capcom alumni, and you see the stuff they made, like Bayonetta, you know, which is sort of like Devil May Cry. You know, you're going to see a lot more of this stuff. So, um, yeah, man, uh, mighty number no. nine was actually the first project I kickstarted. I, I joined Kickstarter specifically to fund this. And, uh, now I use Kickstarter quite a bit to fund a lot of projects that I'm interested in. So let me posit this. Um, you're saying a lot of, co a lot of companies that we know from the past are, are kind of branching off, um, key people from those companies are, are creating new companies to do new things and they're getting a lot of fans who are familiar with their old work so what happens to the old properties now for example um the key people from rare have now formed platonic so what happens to microsoft's rare now well, they still got people in it. They still got rare veterans. They just don't have as many. And those rare veterans are training newer people. You know, I wasn't all that interested in uh, Connect Sports Rivals because I'm not really into motion control gaming anymore. But from what I've seen, like the gameplay footage, Rare still kind of has that old magic. I would love to see what the new blood is capable of doing. Just because some key members leave doesn't mean the new people can not, you know, replicate that magic. You know, I don't know though. I haven't seen uh, outside of Connect Sports. I haven't seen what Rare is capable of now. And I know that they're announcing something E3. They did confirm that Rare is announcing a game, but they haven't said what game that is. And it's not a Connect title. It's not a Connect title. It is not a Connect title. I think people so. were concerned about that. Yeah, uh, it is not a Connect title. And some of the people. Uh, in fact, some of the people at Platonic said, "Yeah, we saw what Rare is working on. We think people will be happy." That's all they said. We don't know what it is. Okay. But there we go. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Um, as for Mega Man, uh, <laughs> I love Mega Man, and I hope to see him in a game again someday. Uh, but for now, it seems like Capcom's only too happy to relegate him for merchandise and cameo appearances, and I hope that changes. I really do, especially considering that Mighty Number no. 9's coming out this year. But uh, we'll just have to wait and see. The rest is up to Capcom at this point. I wonder why they called it Mighty Number no. 9. Like, what happened to 1 through 8? <laughs> well, 1 through 8 are actually the, the, the robots you're fighting. See, Beck is... Oh, okay. The main protagonist's name is Beck, but his number, he's, his model number is Mighty No. 9. He's part of the Mighty series. So he's the last in the line, the current line of Mighty Numbers. Hmm. Yeah. He's a Mighty yeah, Pedro, Number. Pedro, by the way, I was at that... Uh... You're a gamer expo meeting with Shahid throwing the money at the screen. It was amazing. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, when well, oh. the fact they announced that they were backing up the Vita, I was right in front front of the show. Oh, that must have been quite the sight. He and Shahid yeah. are tight, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I ended up having it, I ended up chatting with him after the show. It was nice. <laughs> I got to chat with him once. He's an awesome guy. Yeah, yeah he's a pretty good guy. I hope to see him again at Eurogamer actually. I wonder yeah, I still, I'll always remember that. That was probably my best moment that, uh, for any journalist sort of thing ever. The fact that everyone was fighting to see him, and then I just walked up and said, oh, I'm Chile from PSU. Oh, yeah, I know you from Twitter. And then we ended up chatting, and I know everyone was like in the background saying, who is he? Why is he getting to talk? <laughs> As they're all fighting each other to get to him. <laughs> And you're like, no, man, we're cool. We're cool. We go way back. We're cool. We, like go, we go back to that message I sent you last week saying hello on Twitter. <laughs> Good I, times. I wonder Good if we times. can get him on 4GO one week. That would be awesome. I could get him on, probably. I could ask him. Oh, yeah. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I still got his email, so I can see. I know he's, he's been on holiday recently, so. Oh, no, uh, we don't want to bother the man on holiday, but. Yeah. Uh, when he's back, when or he's even back maybe if. I could get your. I could see if Chin wants to be on. Yeah, I never got to meet Chin. To meet Chin. Chin is amazing. <laughs> he's just had an operation. In fact, he's got like he's got six weeks where he's you know he's been told he can't do too many weights. Oh, cool. Well, let's 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 meet him while he has time. While he has yeah, time. while he has time. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to bother these guys. Um, for those of you who don't know, Shahid Ahmad is someone that you've probably know from Sony press conferences. And Chin Su Young, what does Chin do specifically again? Uh, he's the community manager for Tecmo Koei. That's it. That's uh, it. Last time I saw him in real life was February. Uh, we were, I had a, 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 uh, what's it called, a, an event for the new Tokuden. Uh, so I went down to London, met the guy, and we got to play the game. And I wrote a preview for PSU. That would be cool. Yeah. Well, that was in February, so that was, that was fun. That would be awesome. Yeah. All right, well, who knows? We're sitting here having, like, non-podcast conversations on the podcast, so there we go. Um, <laughs> reality is blurring. At um, 3 a.m., everything blurs. <laughs> <laughs> ben, have you... <laughs> let's continue so that you can get to bed. Have you heard anything about Mighty Number no. 9? Actually, believe it or not, this is the first time I'm hearing about Mighty Number no. 9. Well, as I said, I was at, at that press conference. You were at the press conference, I'm again. sorry. It's, it's only 10 p.m. here, but my brain doesn't work <laughs> anyway. So, uh, yeah. uh, so where he game. announced the fact that it was coming to the Vita and stuff. The Vita, right. Yeah. Oh, it's coming so. out for everything. Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS4, PS Vita, Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo Wii U, Max, Linux. I want it for, I want it for my Max. Mega Drive. Uh, Max, Mac and Linux. <laughs> Max and Linux. <laughs> Max and Linux. This just sounds like a 90s version. Max Extreme Edge. <laughs> Introducing the Max console. <laughs> With uh. more edginess. 10%. 10 more edgy more edge. than Mac. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> Released with Blood Gun. <laughs> well, okay, Keiji Inafune, who's often credited as the father of Mega Man, though that's not technically true, but he's definitely responsible for a lot of the hits in Mega Man. Basically, he's the one who created Mighty Number no. 9 because essentially Capcom's not making Mega Man and he knows people want another one. So he uh, created the closest thing to it, Mighty Number no. 9. And uh, that's why a lot of people back it. just called it Man Mega. <laughs> Man Mega. I like it. <laughs> Ben's pretty good at coming up with names. Or, or call it oh, Mega Man in fine. Japan and Rock Man here. Rock yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> he I rocks, still, man. I, I still, I must admit, we, I know it's completely off topic, but I, I must admit, when you talk about different Japanese names, I always think that Resident Evil has a much better name in Japan than it does anywhere else. Oh, easily. Biohazard, I, man. Yeah. What, what, is, what is even Resident Evil? What is even it? Well, I think it was because the first game took place in the mansion, and there's e an evil resident in the mansion, you know. So I think that that was what it was. Then why don't they call it evil resident? Why do they call it resident evil? <laughs> I don't know. Evil mansion, mansion evil, mansion resident of evil. Mansion. Yeah, I agree. Though biohazard is a much more appropriate and much cooler sounding name. Yeah. I know there was licensing issues, but I could just spell it more keel. <laughs> put pause in it maybe or something yeah, right. um, 
hey guys. spaces or caps locks or just something to make it completely different to the trademark. Yeah. Okay, guys, there's just one more thing we want to talk about, and it's probably something you are all familiar with, and that is Silent Hill. Um, you're doing such a good job, Pedro. Take it away. <laughs> well, Konami finally confirms that Silent Hills is cancelled. Why? <laughs> the thing looked really, really good. Uh, essentially, uh, basically, I'll read a little excerpt again from GameSpot. Following a second day of disquieting rumors concerning the Silent Hills project on Monday, publisher Konami confirmed that it has terminated plans to develop the game. Although Konami initially declined to comment on the matter when contacted early on Monday, later in the day it issued a statement to GameSpot, uh, putting speculation surrounding the title to rest. Konami is committed to the new, uh, to new Silent Hill titles. However, the embryonic Silent Hills project, developed with Guillermo del Toro and featuring the likeness of Norman Reedus, will not be continued. Um, there's a lot of, like, I think there was, like, a lot of uh, speculation that, you know, because it had to do with, like, Hideo Kojima leaving and stuff to do with, like, the Fox engine. I, I think they all kind of left on um, pretty, I, I, can't, I can't say for sure, but it, it seems like they didn't really leave on good terms. You know, it says, on Sunday, Guillermo del Toro was quoted saying to his fans that his collaboration with Konami is, quote, not going to happen. Uh, and that Norman Reedus, uh, the actor initially signed on to star in it, has, uh, ex well, wait, hang on. Ga oh, Konami confirmed the game spot, uh, that the partnership has expired. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's really, really, really tragic. Because I've played PT, I've seen the ending, and the graphics were just so phenomenal. You could see, like, the texture on the wall. It was so detailed. Like, and it was legitimately scary. It was one of the most, like, honestly, unnerving experiences you can ever have. Um, so that's, that's kind of part one of this story. What I actually really want to talk about is this right here. Uh, basically... Uh, one second, Pedro. Are... Huh? Uh, you know about the graphics? Do you know that Kojima actually said they downgraded the graphics? For the demo, just so it looked it looked a little bit different. The actual graphics they actually had running was better, but they really? wanted to make it look like yeah, they wanted to make it look like an indie title, so they made the graphics worse. Oh my god, really? Because I remember when I first uh, when I that was basically the first game I played on my PS4, yeah. and when I played it, and I was walking around, I was just like, wow, I was really blown away by how this game looked. I haven't seen a game look anything like that. You know, and uh, I was, wow, I was just really blown away. But, uh, uh, well, oh, sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, one sec, this, this is, well, this is linked, this should have a link to the article, but yeah, I can't find it actually, no, but yeah, I remember reading it a while back that it, it was downgraded because they were worried that people would know it was a AAA studio not making it, making it, so... Yeah, you know, they were trying to hide the fact it was Kojima at one point, weren't they? That is clever, that is really clever. <laughs> so make wow. it worse so that people think oh is it indie is it, is it AA triple A <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that blows my that mind is, that is really cool sneaky <laughs> sneaky it's and it utilizes the fox engine right that 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 utilized the, yeah. the, the fox engine from metal gear from yeah. the current one so um well okay so here's what what I kind of want to talk about now because essentially before <laughs> Before Konami kind of uh, announced that the project is essentially dead, they were pulling PT from the PS Store's uh, uh, online store. Um, and uh, so people had a, a one last minute chance to sort of download the game. In fact, I remember, didn't we remark on that like last week? We, we mentioned that, that it was coming off the store? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, and then it, literally the next day they announced it uh, right. that it was that it was uh, canceled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so essentially people are selling their PlayStation Four consoles with PT installed for one thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, and this is from the the, the Daily Dot, uh, the playable teaser for the now canceled Silent Hill Survivor horror game that would have starred Norman Reedus has been co-produced by uh, Guillermo del Toro. Was terrifying, photorealistic graphics. A twist of impossible physics, demonic images, and spine-chilling sound design hinted at how satisfyingly scary Silent Hills might have been. PT was pulled off by the uh, the PlayStation Store on Wednesday, which means that if you don't have the game on your PS4, you never will. Uh, and uh, 
that basically made it a rare commodity, and any PlayStation 4 that has the game installed on it is now much, much more valuable. Which uh, makes me shake my head, by the way, considering the price that those dumb... Uh, excuse me, couldn't speak for a second. But those dumb limited edition PlayStation 4s went for? Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> they were beautiful consoles, but certainly not worth that much. Well, the funny thing is, David and I, my, my brother, we kind of went uh, halvesies on the PS4 here. And I'm almost, it, it's so funny considering how much it's worth now, because I could literally sell the PS4 we have, and then have enough money to buy ourselves two PS4s and buy back all the games we currently purchased. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, are you going to do it? Nah, I, I like PT. I, I, I kind of, I would. you never know if I want to be in the mood to play it again. Yeah. So, but but it is an, it it is a tempting prospect. It really is. Well, there you go. Um, I've been seeing things that said that they might still. I mean, the the game Silent Hill is is going to be down, but they are still up for making Silent Hill franchise like like a, a Silent Hill mobile game or something like that. I think I saw something about so. Um, I don't know where they're going with it. There is a petition to get it going again that has gotten about 71,000 signatures, something like that so far. So that's that's crazy. There's a lot of support for the game. Actually, the last time I remember a big game, um, or I should say a well-anticipated game going down like that, was uh, Star Wars 1313. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a big one. It was it was going to take Star Wars into a more mature, a grittier direction. Um, and then... Disney bought the Disney bought Star Wars and the studio that was working on it is gone. The the project's down. Uh, its Wikipedia page says it's on hold, and there's an article on Slash Gear that says, "Hey, it's probably not dead. It probably won't come out under the same name, but the concept will probably re be released as a full fledged video game at some point." So, um, you can if you don't know about that game, it did look fantastic. There are trailers out. Um, you can find them on YouTube. And um, it was going to come out on PS4 and Xbox One and PC, I believe. So, I mean, 1313 isn't coming out, at least not as 1313. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to Silent Hill, but that did. It, it now has Flappy Bird Syndrome. where people Well, are, you know, the franchise will live on, but this particular title, unfortunately, I think is gone. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know if Konami has the rights to the Fox engine. I think they do because they're, they're the ones that funded it. But uh, I, it seems like Kojima knows how to use the engine as opposed to uh, like Konami in general. So I don't know if it would utilize the Fox engine or have to be rebuilt from the ground up, but I don't know. Dun, dun, dun. We shall yeah. see. Um, ben, all, I'm gonna, all I'm going to say is I want Konami to make a new Yu-Gi-Oh game. That's all I want from them. That's all I want. I want them to make another Dance Dance Revolution, man. That was my jam. Well, I imagine a Yu-Gi-Oh game using the Project Morpheus where you can see the monsters. Project Didn't Konami Morpheus. take itself off the U.S. stocks? Yeah, it did around the same time as the PT thingy removal. What, didn't they? I believe so. Like, a lot of people are thinking that, that Konami might be... Uh, uh, Leaving the gaming scene and and focusing on gambling, I I, I don't know, I don't see that. Well, I, I they, well, they've always they always they always had their Yu-Gi-Ohs. Yeah, <laughs> I I guess, man. Yeah, I I can't see Konami leaving the gaming stuff. They got too many. They got too many like well-established, well-known, and well-loved franchises for that. You know, uh, they've got they Hudson, even said yeah, they don't use anything from that. You, you guess Konami. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't well, they, they said they still use they still they have. do Metal Gear without uh, this guy Kojima. Wait, yeah, yeah but then they probably got realized how many people didn't want it. <laughs> how many people want Metal Gear but not without Kojima? That's true. I, I, I certainly would be less interested. I mean, it just <laughs> specific style. Too. <laughs> well, Platinum did pretty good in uh, Revengeance, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. So I imagine maybe the Metal Gear spinoff series will continue. I think Kojima helped with that in a way that gave them the original like ideas. I think so. I think so. But given Platinum, listen, Platinum is one of my new favorite developers, and they always, every time they release a title, well, not every time, but almost every time they release a title, it doesn't sell as well as it deserves to, and it always gets a cult following afterwards. 
Uh, uh, I don't know, man. Anyway, <coughs> Metal Gear 2. <coughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Metal Gear 2. I went off on a tangent there. Metal Gear 2. Um, did you, you guys know Metal Gear 2, right? Yes, I do. That was, uh, that was not done by Kojima at all. Really? That was a Konami-only thing. Huh. Uh, in fact, it was very. Dis- that's why we got a new one. Uh, Metal Gear. That's why we got an actual Metal Gear Two in the end, because the original version was so abysmal that Kojima had to go back to make a new one. Was are you are you talking about Snake's Revenge? Is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that one. Yeah, he, he he pretty much disowned that one. Yeah, so that's exactly what's going to happen with this new Metal Gear, whatever it's going to be called, Metal Gear Liquid's Revenge. Yeah, right. The hater's revenge. <laughs> uh, yeah, hate. David, anyway, so- David hater's revenge. Haters, <laughs> yeah, the hater's gonna hate edition. <laughs> oh, by the way, yeah. you were talking about them delisting. I was just looked online. Uh, it was literally right after Silent Hills was cancelled on the same day. Wow, really? Yeah, it See says that? April 27th, Silent Hills cancelled. April 27th, Konami delist, delist itself from the New York Stock Exchange. I don't know how many hours in between the two, but it was pretty much. Well, I, said, I, think that's, the, I think the statement they gave was was just essentially to save money. I think I'm yeah. not sure. It, but it was about three were hours out difference. Yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, um, we're gonna start to wrap things up here. Is that okay? Yep. <laughs> All right. A good ninety minutes of interesting discussion there. I'm I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so episode nine of Four Gamers Only is now in the books, and we are good to go and ready for episode ten next week. Um, still planning to have someone new join the crew, and um, I am talking with that person. We will see what happens, um, but stay tuned to Four Go, and we will bring you the good stuff. Um, if you would like to join the discussion, follow us on Twitter at 4G only, at number four, and then G O N L Y. Um, no, that is not for a cell phone company, that is indeed for us, 4G only. And we will read your tweets on the air, on the podcast, and we will respond to them. Feel free to leave us reviews on iTunes, on Stitcher, wherever you can find us, and we will read those on the air too. Uh, we are on Stitcher, guys. Stitcher helps us out quite a bit if we can get to the level where it will help us out quite a bit. Um, and that will only happen through your listening, through your listenership, if that's a word. I think it is. Not sure. Um, so check us out on Stitcher. We are there. We are also on iTunes. If you don't feel like checking out Stitcher, we're, we're still on iTunes um, or wherever you want to find us. 4 com is our website. Uh, quote-unquote website. Um, And we're also looking at going on SoundCloud. We have a Patreon account. Um, If you would like to throw a few dollars our way, um, we would love to get this podcast on a self-sufficient status where we're not paying out of pocket to run it. Um, That is like goal number one right now. So um, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's kind of like Kickstarter, but it's not for big projects. It's for smaller projects and ongoing projects that don't need a whole heck of a lot of funding. So um, goodness, if you can, if you want to donate, you can choose how much you want to donate. Um, you can cancel at any time. I think it, it tries to do a recurring um, donation for each work. So yes, a recurring donation, but you can cancel at any time. Exactly. Um, except for, I think, if it's literally the day of... Right. You know. Right. So um, you can cancel it. If you say, say, you, say you want to donate a dollar per episode on Patreon. Yeah. So that's like, what, $4 a month. Um, say one day, I don't know, funds are extremely tight and a dollar's just not going to cut it for you, or you just think we suck. Hey, one of the two. Um, you can, Get that bet off the show. You can go to patreon.com and cancel immediately and you will you will give us no more money. No more of your hard earned money. Um so patreon.com, dude, that would really support us. That would really help us out. Um ultimately we would like to have a show with good uh, with better audio quality um that's self-sufficient that we're not paying for out of pocket and this would be a great step to getting there so patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash number four g-o patreon.com slash four g-o that's us um 
If and you remember would... though, guys, if you donate enough, you can get a t-shirt. Actually, yeah, we're, I'm. I've designed a few t-shirts on Zazzle.com. I have a couple that make fun of my height. I'm six foot seven. I'm a tall dude. <laughs> Um, and I made those on Zazzle. I'm going to make some shirts on Zazzle, and if you donate enough, I'll send you a, a, a T-shirt. Yeah. It says 4GO, and it says your name, and all this cool stuff. So um, donate away. We would, we would appreciate it. We would love you for it. Thank you for that. You um, walk away with some nice swag. Some 4GOs. Yeah. I'm not using that word. But okay. I am really four- tempted to donate $20 just so I can get a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the the twenty dollars would pay for the shirt. I'll, I'll make Ben a shirt. There we go. Yes. Um, <laughs> twenty dollars. All right. Um, if you would like to contact us, you may. Um, you can use our Twitter at four G only, or you can email us at four G O cast at gmail dot com. Um, if you would like to reach Ben specifically, um, he is offering his personal contact information up for your consideration. Ooh. Okay, Ben. Ooh. What is it? Well, if you want to stalk me, guys, you know, uh, <laughs> Chili underscore UK on Twitter, Chili on PSN. I've been taking a hotmail.com, uh, Ben dot Hall at PSU.com, Chili on Neogaf, my house. No, it's don't, don't, don't give your, <laughs> no. no, no, I will draw a line. line. That's, but you know, you can find me at all these places and more. Okay. Um, actually, if you, if you want to reach me on Twitter, you can. <laughs> Gogwen underscore, G-O-G-L-E-N-N underscore. Um, I don't always say gaming-related stuff, but if you're interested in the personal ramblings of a college graduate that is in debt and does a gaming podcast, um, that's where you can find that. So, there you go. Um, how's I was going to say, doing? a college graduate that's in debt, that's like most of them. <laughs> Uh, I think you guys could still contact me on what was it, 4 Geocast? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah right there. That's where you can get me. 4 Geocast at Gmail or at 4 G only. Pedro will get your messages. And so will Bailey. Um, yes. Yeah. But she's... Of, I think <laughs> Bailey needs more emails. We need more we need more fan images of Bailey. We do. That's right. I yeah, I need to I need to, you know, just take a photo of her and uh put it up there and then you guys could draw some fan images. Yeah, she's very. Yeah, I, I'm tempted. I might. I'm tempted to announce a competition sometime to give a prize out to someone who does a fan pick of Bailey. Oh, which reminds <laughs> me, Ben. Uh, how's your competition going? Uh, we've had a massive zero entries. Oh, great! So uh, yeah, no, it's, it's going wonderful. What are you giving away again? Uh, uh, Xbox 360, Hard Edition of Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And what do you uh, have you to want... do to get it? Uh, what is the returning protagonist from Black Ops 1 that returns to Black Ops 2? Just mm. email me at the stuff you just. Heard. Yep, and yeah, you'll get a free game for Xbox 360. Check that out. Yeah. Um, oh, wasn't that also like, a, isn't that like a region locked game too, though? Right? Uh, yeah. It's yeah, just, just to make sure you specify that. It is yeah. only it's... for UK peoples. Yeah. But you can look at it still. You can you go, can... oh, that's one pretty game. <laughs> you can put it on your shelf. Yeah. But it does have all the collector's edition stuff in it, so it has the coins, the art book, the soundtrack, the steel book, so. Oh, that's goodness. still pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you might not be able to play it. If you get a, if you get a, look at it. if you get a normal copy of the game, you can keep it in that yeah. steel book and have all that yeah. stuff. So, who knows? Um, go ahead and, and do what you got to do and get some free stuff. That's how you do yeah. it. Um, all right, guys, we are. No, wait, nope. There's one more thing I've got to do. Music. I can't. I can't leave without talking about music. We love music here um, because we're gamers, and gamers. Actually, everybody loves music. What would this world be without music? Um, Overclocked Remix is our favorite go-to place for music, um, in part because there's great music and in part because they allow us to use it without paying royalties. So, um, <laughs> Overclocked Remix, ocremix.org, our intro this week is from Banjo-Kazooie. Um, it is a remix called Wallachian Prince. I don't know how to pronounce the word Wallachian, Wallachian. Um, but the remix is by OA, you heard it at the beginning of the show, and you are hearing it in the background right now. Our outro is Girl from Another World from Ultra Street Fighter 4. Um, it's from, it's the theme of Decaper. Decaper. I, I, I don't pron- why do I pick music with names that I can't pronounce? <laughs> um, anyway. Because you like to punish yourself. <laughs> anyway, um, the remix is done by Neblix. Both of these are available on ocremix.org. 
There are something like 3,000 and change different video game remixes up there. All of them are completely free. In fact, there's a whole torrent file that you can download all this stuff. It's completely free, completely legal. Um, so to hear all of this music and many more video game remixes in full for free, ocremix.org, O-C-R-E-M-I-X dot O-R-G. And with that, we are done for the week. Tune in next week, ladies and gentlemen, for episode 10 of 4GO. Until then, I am Glenn Gordon. We've got Ben Shalabir Hall and Pedro Wait. the Birdman Gonzalez. Um, signing off from what show, Ben? Uh, well, I think we're forewarned goats only. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. See you, guys. <laughs>